Graham Walker, who is coming from the, who is the vice chair of the Upper Thames branch of Butterfly Conservation Group. He's also the chairman of the Conservation and Recording Committee, a silver studded blue champion and 10 kilometer square champion. Um, he's vice chairman of the Berkshire Moth Group and with other hats, he's also the senior park ranger for Early Town Council, vice chairman of the Early Environmental Group and chairman of the trustees for Brimpton Fuel Allotment. And he also sits on the Wildlife Site Selection Panel for Berkshire. Um, he's going to talk to you about some of the resources that are used to identify um, butterflies and, and, moths. and moths as well. So I'll leave you. I'll leave it with your Thank hands. You very much. Right. So I know a little bit about butterflies and moths. A bit less about IT. So. <laughs> If it looks a bit fuzzy on some of the slides from the back, it's not your eyesight. Don't go to the opticians. So I'm here to convince you today that you've never had it so good when it comes to butterfly and moth recording, as Harold McMillan would have had it. Um, only 20, 30 years ago, resources were very thin on the ground and quite frankly, fairly poor. Now it's dreadfully easy. Um, so, before I go on to the books, how many people here know most of their butterflies? Well, you. Which live in my area. There you go. That's, that's all we need to know. And how many people actually enter those as data? Small number. So quite frankly, butterflies, dreadfully easy. Only about 60, all of which are identifiable. So how many people are going to be sending records in and identifying them for next year and sending records in? Is that everybody? I should hope that's everybody. <laughs> Moths are a little bit trickier, two and a half thousand. But the resources these days are so easy, any of you could start mothing next week and do as well as I did after 10 years, I would think. So do bear in mind that Lepidoptera, nice, easy group. What time do we, what have we got? Back to 22. So I just said it was about books. And the first thing I'm showing you is not a book, but a field studies chart. How many people know about the Field Studies Council charts? They are brilliant. They're, you can put them down in damp grass, just about get away with it. And you can see that... squeeze your species to match the few that are in the book or the chart. The other thing I would say, only buy, sorry Brian, I know we've got a lot of European books there, I would only buy books that are only British if you're starting off. If you're looking at all the blue butterflies of Europe and you've got to work out whether it's got three freckles behind its knee or four, that's a bit off-putting. All the British species, dreadfully easy. They're not money spiders. They're not tachinid flies. They're big, beautiful, easy to identify creatures. So you can see these are what look like um, fabulously taken photographs. They're Richard Lewington paintings. Now he's the world's leading expert on painting butterflies and moths. And he lives in our area-ish, in Oxfordshire. And they are just magnificent. And you'll see his name appear time and time and time again. So I would highly recommend these. It's got information on the back, all the British species. Sometimes that's male and female. It's got most of what you'll need, and it's light to carry. You can also get ones on the British hawk moths, you can get ones on the caterpillars, 
You can get the day flying moths. The hawk moths, the caterpillars, got all of the species on. Just be a little bit wary when you get into the day flying moths. Because some moths will fly as you kick them easily, some less easily. You might be seeing one that won't appear on the chart. So when it comes to the books, if you just want one simple book, I would reckon this pocket guide to the butterflies of Great Britain and Ireland, text and obviously the beautiful paintings by Richard Lewington. And it contains all you need to need, a bit of introductory text. You've got a, a site map, you've got beautiful, um, paintings of all of the different life stages. You've got a, a chart at the bottom to tell you when to look out for each life stage. All the caterpillar food plants, all in one fairly small, fairly inexpensive book. I think this was about a tenner and it's still available. So if you just want one simple book, that's one I would recommend. Some people prefer the paintings of Richard Lewington because what he's done is he's distilled, distilled down hundreds of specimens into one idealized um, butterfly that incorporates all the jizz and, that you're likely to want to uh, look at. Some people prefer photographs. This book is available on Brian Sand at the back, so you can look at this one at lunchtime. And this is beautifully put together and you can see it's by Newland Still, Swash and Tomlinson, who have done a, a series of other books. And again, it's got all you need to know, but this time it's in photographs. Again, you've got behavior, the life cycle, the population, uh, the life cycle chart, you've got distribution. So everything you need to know, all in one book. Beautifully done. Um, I personally had quite a pong shot for the first edition because they very cleverly put all of the life cycle bits and the male and female all on one picture. So a technological marvel, but they obviously thought that was a bit too clever and they've moved back to a more standard format in the, the later editions. It also includes pictures of all the caterpillars, which is always useful to have. The problem with caterpillars is they often change as they go through their various instars. And pretty much most of the books only show the final instar. You just have to bear that in mind. Now, if you're looking for a book, uh, well up in this map down here. If you're looking for a book that's got more information in it, then this one by Jeremy Thomas and Richard Lewington. It's absolutely fabulous. It's probably the book on the subject, but you can see it's not that mobile. So there is no best butterfly book. It depends what you want it for at that particular moment. But if you're sitting at home and reading about the butterfly and you want to know as much about that species as you can, then I would highly recommend this book. Jeremy Thomas, very knowledgeable. Um, I think this is like the fourth edition now. And every so often we hope he's going to update it because there is new knowledge coming along. And the thing with books, of course, is they are set in time. So you can see it's got lots of words, the same beautiful diagrams by uh, diagram paintings by Richard Lewington, all the information you need to know and more information. So this is an information book, not a field guide. If you want to know about butterflies in general, their life history, their ecology, their conservation, everything in butterflies in the round, then Martin Warren, who for many years was the, uh, the head of butterfly conservation, is now uh, part of Butterfly Conservation Europe. Really, really knowledgeable person. Mostly words, this book. So again, it's a sitting at home in your armchair book, but a fabulous one to own. Uh, and you can see, everything you need to know about butterflies all in one book but it's not an id book if you want to know a bit more about the life cycles peter eels who lives in thatcham so within berkshire 
He's produced the life cycles of British and Irish butterflies. And this got all the different instars and even the changing color of the egg as it hatches. So if you want to know just about the life cycle, then this is the book to go for. If it's caterpillars alone you're looking for, this is another book that's illustrated by Richard Lewington. You'll notice he crops up an awful lot. And so this has the caterpillars, but I believe it's only the macromoss and the and the butterflies. As you know, the, the lepidoptera are really just one group of insects, really. They're all the scale wings. So if you blow their wings up, they look like the roofs of your house. And we like to differentiate them into butterflies and moths. French would have that as a bit silly, and they have butterflies of the day and butterflies of the night, and papillon de nuit. We like to differentiate them, and we think they're really separate. But they are just really families of moths, really, in the real world. You've got the micromoths, you've got the butterflies, you've got the macromoths in a sort of evolutionary scale. So the micromoths, lots of them, they often get left out, as they did in this one. But you've got information about the life histories of caterpillars in general. You've got, here we've got the geometer moths. You've got their distribution maps, all the information you need to know about the caterpillar. Then we come on to moths. Now moths are quite interesting because they used to be very, very poor in the books. This one originally came out in 1908 and it was a, it was a good attempt, but the paintings are quite wishy-washy and a bit hard to define what you're actually looking at. Then we had to wait till 1984, I believe, for the Moths of the British Isles to come out. And this was a, a definite improvement. These were photographs. And as you can see, they're all set specimens. How many set specimens do you see out in the field? And the problem is that the, you know, that's quite clearly a heart. But when they open their wings and they're set, it's a completely different configuration. The human eye sees what it sees as the two wings together. So we had to wait until this book came along. Leave up not, Richard Lewington. Along with uh, Martin Townsend, who's the county recorder for Oxfordshire, and Paul Waring, who's a, a well-known mother, which who looks a bit like Elvis. And uh, they came up with this fabulous book picked a pretty page, not so typical of the book, because you can see they've opened the wings slightly to show you the underside, because that's quite characteristic. But most of it, it's just moss as you would see them in the field. And to be fair, if you give these a little poke, they do show you the red, because obviously they want to scare off predators. So in many ways, that is as you see them in the field. But it's quite a big book. It's quite heavy. You can see it's quite large, but it does have all of the macro moths in it and plenty of text. And you have to refer back to the text. But as you'd expect, every detail you'd need to know. Now, some people are very happy with that. Others say that's too heavy. So they produce the same book again, but with half the text taken out. And this time, it's spiral bound, so you can lay it flat in the field. It's got a plastic cover, so you can lay it in wet grass. And to make it easy for you, because they've got so little text, they can match the number of species on that page with this page. So they're now able to put the text and the images opposite each other, which makes flicking through the book much easier than right there. So you either get more, you pay more money and you get more information, or you pay less money and you get a more concise format that you can take out with you. Then this is a newish book. Um, this one is, I suppose you might call it, a, well, a gateway guide. It's a gateway into macro moths. 
And so if I open a page here, it's China Marks and other crumb bids. This one's Summer Flying Pugs. So these groups together, moths that look similar and generally fly at a similar time, and that you might get confused. Now, none of the books so far are what I would call ID books. I call them field guides. And there's a big, big lacking in British books on what I would call ID books. And I think an ID book is one where in the text, it points to a number with a little line. So you're not thinking, oh, it's the third spot on the costa edge of the wing. And going, oh, I'm not sure where he means now. Big arrow pointing to it. That's an ID book, very rare in Britain. So that's quite useful, but its downside is it doesn't have all the species in. Going up the scale in size, a book you definitely won't be carrying around with you. And this is uh, the book of all the data known in Britain up until 2019, I think, of moss going back in the last two centuries. So this is a book of maps. So dot maps, a little bit of information, but all of the micro moths. Again, no butterflies, no micro moths. So that's really nice book to have, but it is a coffee table book, table book. You won't be taking it out with you. Right, this one's hot off the press. And it is available on the uh, table back there because Brian's kindly agreed to sell it. So all the money for this goes back into mothing efforts when we decide what we need to spend the money on. This is the second edition. It's Common Micro Moths of Berkshire. And this is, again, only the second one I've got today, an ID book. All these little annotations pointing to exactly the point on the wing that you need to be looking at. If not a field guide where you have to work quite hard at it, but an ID book. So £15. It used to have a hundred moths in it. These are all, as it says, micro moths, quite hard to get into. But when you actually get there and you take a picture with the camera and you blow it up, they are equally stunning, if not more so, than most of our butterflies and macro moths. It just turns out we're too enormous to understand that. They're just too big, great oafish creatures. But obviously in the scheme of the natural world, these are absolute giants. These are the elephants of the natural world, because most things you can fit 10,000 on your little fingernail. But with our eyesight, we find them quite small. So it's quite nice to have them blown up and to have pointers to exactly what you want and thumbnail sketches at the beginning so you can quickly get to where you're going. So that is the ones you're most likely to see. So if you're looking for a way into Micromoss, and you all should be, this is the book to get. And as you can see on the side, you need to look at that point, that point, that point. All pointed out to you, all in the text, all nice and on one page. And similar species if you need it. So that leads you on then to the Bible of the group, which is this one. And this is a similar book to the other field guide on moths, but this one's the micro moths. So this is the, the tome that will have all the species in and all the information. But again, it's a field guide, not an ID book. So very, very useful because you won't find one that isn't in there. Unless it's hopped over the channel in the last year. I believe there is another edition possibly in just over a year's time coming out. But if you're into Micromoss, and why wouldn't you? They're beautiful. 800 Macromoss, 2,500 moths in total. You can do the sums. Most of them are micro. Again, some people prefer a photo book. And Manley's book, now in its third edition, a fabulous book. The first edition had the butterflies in, he's kicked those out. 
but he has now introduced the micro moss and the beautiful photographs of all of the macro and micro moss. So two and a half thousand species, little thumbnails, good little information. Um, it's hard to know which is best of all these books. I tend to dip into quite a few of them. Um, but this is a, a very nice book. And for the money, you get an awful lot of photographs. Two and a half thousand species, many other photos. I should imagine there's probably 3,000 photographs in there for your money. And it's not that expensive. So I would say that's another good book. I will put all the books out somewhere to look. Please don't walk off of them. Um, you can look at these over lunchtime. So, some people would say books are old hat. We've all moved online. It's the World Wide Web. It's the exciting era of technology. But taking a big computer out into the field or into your garden is still a bit tricky. You can look on your phone, but quite frankly, they're tiny. Take your iPad, you're somewhere in between, then you're probably okay. There is a huge amount of information online. Personally, I don't think it replaces books. I think it augments the books. Um, 10, 15 years ago, they were outlining the demise of the book. They'd all be in museums. You'd never see one again. Bookshops do booming trade these days. So that was um, a prediction that never came true, and I'm not sure I ever will. But don't write off online because it's really, really useful. It's in your pocket when you need it. Your book might be at home. And so there's lots. Now, I'm not a techie, so I'm hoping to learn from you and the audience if you've used other sites and things that you find brilliant. So I'm hoping this is a two-way thing, and I'll go away a smarter person. So the first one we're going to look at is a thing called Hans Moss Flying Tonight. So you find a moth in the field or in your trap. How many people have moth traps? A few, excellent. How many people will have them by next year? That should be everybody. Hands up now. That'll be everybody. The great thing about moth traps, how many butterfly species are you likely to see in your garden over a, over a summer, say? Three? Six? Ten, maybe? You can put your moth trap out. Get 60, 80 species on one July night. So you can get more in one night in your garden than there are British butterflies on the entire list. Now, to see all those butterflies, you've got to go to John O'Groats and Land's End. You've got to go on sunny days. You've got to go when the weather's good. You've got to get permission from your partner to be, be away from home and not looking after the kids. Very inconvenient butterflies and a bit insignificant ecologically. All the information... All the important people, the birders will tell you, if all the butterflies disappeared, you'd still have plenty of blue tits. If all the moths disappeared, no blue tits. So you can see where the important end lies. And they're in your garden. More species on one night than all the British butterflies. And they're there all year, 12 months of the year, you can be moth in the garden. Sit there with a coffee in the morning, sitting there nice and luxurious, beautiful creatures in front of you and most of which you wouldn't have known existed in your garden. And whatever you do, don't dismiss moths at your peril. You'll be missing out on the best group of British wildlife. Try and see 80 mammals in Britain in the year. These are beautiful creatures, and they'll sit on your finger, a lot of them. Nice and compliant. Try doing that with a bird. So you now need to identify them. And I'm recommending Hans Moss flying tonight, and you're thinking I don't live in Hampshire. But don't forget, Berkshire is a funny little thin sliver sitting on the top of Hampshire. Basically, we're northern Hampshire. And when you go to the site, it will tell you you're looking at for a certain uh, week. So it's now telling you two and a half thousand moths. Don't worry about those. Just the ones that are in your area already come down. Just the ones flying that week come down again. So you can see what seemed mind boggling down to a reasonable number. You thought that was easy? They've now put them in order of the likelihood of seeing them. The most records, the next most, the next most. 
And you go, well, that's all very good. I can compare that now. Now I'm down to maybe the top 10 I'm like to see in my garden at any one time, maybe. But the picture's a bit small. You can make it bigger. You can make it smaller. And you can click on the writing. And now you can find out more information. When it flies, the larval, you go, well, I wanted to know more. <laughs> Phenology. Now you can see when it flies, when it's at its peak, the earliest, the latest. And this is all real data. It's real data. So it's not a guess. You might say, well, I'm living in North Oxfordshire. I feel a bit too far away from Hampshire. So the CEH, everyone knows CEH up in Wallingford. They've got to go with various people and they've come up with a almost identical site, really. Well, what's flying tonight? Now, the advantage of this site is it's theoretically based on your house. So that's nice and local data. Of course, it's only as good as the data goes in, data in, data out. But it gives you the same information, more or less, as you get in the Hans one, but it is local to you. So try them both, see which one you like. Use them both, because they're both free, of course. Unlike the books you've had to buy, click on the uh, laptop or something, all this is free information. There are sites that just help you with IDing things, but won't tell you which ones are in the garden that night. And I would say UK Moss is well worth investigating. Lots of useful information. This is telling you a bit about it. Go on there, we pick the large yellow underwing again. Some information, more pictures, click on all these, they'll come up. So again, you've got a huge resource for free at your fingertips. You can go to Butterfly Conservation's national site. You can go to the Upper Thames branch, more local site, and you'll see lots on moss. If you click on that, you'll be able to get to the Upper Thames moss blog. So if you're a blogging type person, you want to know what's happening on a here and now basis about moss in our area. Lots of information there. Got the time to look. And one very new thing that's only started this year is we showed you this atlas which is the national one. Now we've got a local one online. And again, it's free. It has got some deeper bits inside it and you can become, uh, I don't know what they call it, that's named after one of the moths. I think you're a Cinnabar, Golden Cinnabar membership. So you can contribute a little bit of money to help it fund and you can see deeper into it. But most of what you'll need is on the surface and it's free. speed up a bit so you've got lots of information and maps all the lovely species so now we've got into recording i would recommend i record five minutes to go i'd recommend i record but that's where you've got to do a lot of typing so if you want to record frogs water violet anything else i record is great but they've made it easy for butterflies because you can get the free app. We like the word free. When you go to that, you'll get the ability to enter a single species. So you click on the species and you go, I want to record a speckled wood. You click on that. Now it's recorded. You go to the location. And it's giving you a little square and if it's not small enough you can press your finger on it it'll go smaller so now you've recorded all the information you'll need because i used to have little lists i used to forget where they were two years before i entered them i had to go and find the northings and the eastings oh, i couldn't be bothered i've got all sorts of data that never got entered now on your phone you record it when you're there and when you three minutes later two minutes later one minute later done so none of this going back in winter and trying to guess. I can type in M and that'll give me all the list of M's made in early. Now I've got that recorded. I can record whether it's an adult or not. I can record the numbers. And once I'm ready, I can upload and I can upload in the field using my mobile data. Or if I think, oh, I don't want to use up my mobile data. I can wait till I get home, use my internet at home. So that's wonderfully easy. And then it's all gone.
You can record a species list. I'll quickly go through these. And I record a comma and record a red admiral. I could have 30 butterflies on that list. When it comes to area size, you can have one kilometer, 100 meters by 100 meters, or point location. The closer you can get to that point location button to press, which means you're only seeing the butterflies, say, in this area we're all sitting in, the more accurate the data, because you go up to eight figure grid reference. So you can send all those in. You get a list of all your data, how many records you've ever put in, how many records of British butterflies you've ever put in. You can get a map that will show you where you've recorded across Britain, where you've recorded in your local area. Then you've got identification apps. Anybody use many of the identification apps? Yeah. Nature so, Spot. Nature Spot, all those things. So I'd, I'd love to hear what you think. I've literally just picked one today because obviously there's limited time. This one's called OBS Identify, and it originated in Holland. It still seems pretty good for us. So you press identity, you, you can take a photo, or you can use the photos in your own library. So here's one I took, and it says, can you center it and crop it a bit? So you do that. Then you press OBS Identify, and it says, I'm 100% sure that's a large fruit tree tortrix. Great, everyone's an expert now. You have 30 years of knowledge, and suddenly you need just 30 seconds of knowledge. So you can save it, and now it's saved in there. That's saved onto their site. I have no idea where that data goes. So that's great, but make sure you write it in your little book, go onto iRecord, and enter it to iRecord, because that'll go to Butterfly Conservation, it'll go to the Upper Thames, it'll go to T-Book, it'll go to all the important places. So I all need to put it on here because you can look at Roman observations, but don't leave it there. Just a few words of warning, though. It's not infallible. Turns out that 30 seconds wasn't the way to go. It's a brilliant tool. It will get it right most of the time. You just have to be a little bit wary. But then the average moth gets it wrong sometimes. So we can't expect all these tools to be perfect. So this one thinks it's a lesser trouble bar, 58%, or another trouble bar species. It wasn't quite sure. This one thought it was a cloudy brindle, about 33%, or a smooth snake, or an ash tree. It wasn't quite sure. <laughs> this one here, anybody want to guess what they think this moss is? I would say it's, it's a bit hard to say at the back because it's too small. I would say it's probably a trouble brown spot. It thinks it's 75, 76% sure it's a pale cladded yellow butterfly. Or it might be a small, small fan footed wave. It could be a single dotted wave just by turning the image upside down. Just by looking at one wing, it's now changed its mind as a scorched carpet. Don't get put off by these illustrations. It is right most of the time, but not all the time. But it's an aid. You can then look back in the book. Yeah, I think so. Recording across the whole country. People like that. There's a National Moth Night each year. You can go to a National Moth Night event or you can do it in your own garden. The Big Butterfly Count. How many people have done Big Butterfly Count? That'll be everybody next year then. So, why is it important to do the Big Butterfly Count when some of those records might be a bit iffy? Not all experts. It's because it's numbers. It shows the funders, it shows government that people care about wildlife. And that's it. 